Welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Today's guest is Dr. Melissa Mandala, and she's going to be talking about mental health and gut health. She is a lifestyle medicine doctor, and she works with the Institute of Plant-Based Medicine. We have had so many of their wonderful doctors on the show before. They actually can do consults via telemedicine. Please welcome her to the show. It's so nice to see you again. Yes, lovely, Dr. Chef AJ. It's so nice coming for full circle because our community is so close knit and, and we have story after story that really impacts our life. Um, it's life changing, it's game changing. And really, uh, yeah, it's always good to come together because we know our mental health and our gut health um, are never separate. They, they are entwined so deeply. And I'm going to go and just walk you through of that through the science behind it, walk you through the studies, walk you through my personal story. And so that it can, it's very relevant. There's a pandemic of not just COVID, but mental health, depression, anxiety, PTSD, you name it. It's doubling and tripling. So I think this is um, uh, just very timely. So soak it all in. I'm gonna share my screen here and uh, you'll be able to see my PowerPoint. And that, is something that I, I, you know, when I think about all that has to do with food, I, I was a foodie myself, right? Um, I think we can't deny it. We love food, we enjoy it. And I say good mood foods or good food moods, all like all those in those rhyming words, because it really captures our attention. There's such a strong relationship by what we eat um, and what we eat. And so there's this connection that we establish um, with food and our behaviors, because not only is it a substance, but it gives us pleasure, it gives us reward, it, it's suppresses maybe some anxiety or depression. And so I'm going to just walk you through that because it's really a relationship, just like we have a relationship with our friends and family, we have a relationship with our doctor, we also have a relationship with food. So we really want to understand what that relationship is and what it does to our mind, what it does to our hormones, what it does to our gut health. So this is my story. Um, so this is, you know, everyone's doing these 10 year challenges on social media. And I looked at my picture and, you know, that's, I couldn't really find maybe, you know, we're, we're always looking for that one picture that depicts your health. And if you look at my, my face, first of all, you won't see, I had actually really bad cystic acne, tons of, uh, I would say antibiotics, I was on lots of topicals, orals, and nothing really helped. Uh, it just became an, a cycle of inflammation. Not only that, those were the warning signs, but I also had a very upset stomach. I didn't know what it was called, but I, anything would trigger it. So it could have been um, for example, uh, just a stressful day, it could have been cold water or cold air. Um, and I couldn't really put the picture together because it seemed like anything I ate and drank um, and did just made my stomach so mad where I was bloated, I had lots of loose stools and um, of diarrhea, so bits of constipation, but really the bloating and the stomach cramping was very disrupted in my life. I, to the point where I couldn't really go out and uh, into social settings as much as I wanted to. So during my medical training, while everyone was, you know, having a cel birthday celebration, sometimes I would just stay at home because I was in so much pain. Um, and I didn't realize at that time I was stressed out and kind of self-inflicting with food. Um, food, we tend to, go, you know, it's not just the comfort food, but food is the food that we think it should actually give us the nutrition, but I didn't even know what that even looked like in medical school. Obviously, um, we're given, they say about 19 hours, but if you really calculate maybe two hours, but if you ask every doctor, or at least my generation before, they probably only mention hearing food maybe one maybe 10 minutes out of their whole curriculum. So it's very a minute amount of how much you learn in medical school. So I was just self-inflicting with all these unhealthy foods. I lived in Chicago at that time. I was born and raised in, in in Southern California, but in Chicago, Chicago, you have tons of pizza, tons of hot dogs, standard American diet. And um, I went on this fast food lane, meaning um, anytime I was stressed out, I just, there was fast food row and I would go to it every time. <laughs> um, and then I, that's when I got um, increased weight, IBS, actually um, bouts of depression, and anxiety, and my, my concentration was horrible. My performance in medical school was probably not the best at all because I was um, not doing well in my health and my IBS. Um, luckily, 
Um, I, I tweak my diet. I, I found lifestyle medicine. I found the power of plant-based nutrition um, throughout my medical training and specifically the American College of Lifestyle Medicine going to their conference. And it's almost like the immersion because you have no choice. You're getting those meat withdrawals and you're, 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 you don't even realize it, but you then realize the benefits of um, better uh, clarity of mind. Um, your mood is up more energy. And so I realized, you know, this is for me, um, not only for me, and my patients, but this is something I want to do for the long term. And so that's why I did a fellowship at Loma Linda where I trained. And then I, I actually went into primary care psychiatry as an additional fellowship with UCI and UC um, um, Davis. So it's just piles up. I was a psychology major and I just keep me um, full circle, mind, body, spirit connection, but also nutrition, gut, all of that is all intertwined. And then I practiced at Loma Linda inpatient, outpatient and an FQH C center, which is basically patients below the poverty line. And so in all settings and even the urgent care settings, and I would say even that simple conversation of nutrition has made a difference. At least my patients have actually told me and come back to me and said, you know what? I feel so much better. I, I lost the weight. I, I, I got off some of my medications. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And so I would say, in, um, there's a, there's definitely a time and a place and it's not limited by the hospital walls. It's not limited by I would say traditional medicine and it's, it's growing. And so that's why um, I, so I was part of the IOPM, a group practice, and now I'm the co-owner also of Dr. Lifestyle Clinic with my husband. So we're excited about that. Um, so this is my mantra um, that I like to tell myself, you know, there's all this, we want to give ourselves positive self-talk, but on top of that, we want to know exactly what's the direct and the most essential treatment for mood disorders. And I say the first step is a healthy lifestyle and that's prevention and treatment. And when we go to the, um, here, what's happening with this pandemic. So it's doubling up um, 350 million worldwide. So if you look at that, that's a lot of people struggling from depression. And it's then one of the leading causes of disability. So these patients, I get them, unfortunately, is they come to the primary care doctors and they, they're asking me to fill out their paperwork because it's just horrible um, because they, they, are, they can't go out, they can't function, they can't keep their jobs, they, they can't go to class, they're just stuck. Um, and usually it, depression doesn't stand alone. I, I want to just uh, allow you to to let that sink into your brain because I've actually worked in the acute setting where patients just had their stroke, heart attack, liver and heart transplant right after a severe accident. And those are the most prone for depression. So after some um, horrible hospitalization or, uh, or even a diagnosis, even as depression or diabetes, these people are the most vulnerable for depression and the most vulnerable for disability. So never stands alone. Usually we think about um, patients who are obese and you think that's the traditional patient in America, but really it's not just that. It's someone who has actually high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, but it always comes. I would say when I, when I say always, maybe like 90 something percent, I would love to give a specific statistics, but there's typically depression, anxiety attached to it. It's all connected. So um, the sad thing is, um, we know that depression is a symptom of suicide. So the end stage, if we think of the end stages of disease, when actually organs shut down, um, the end stage of depression is suicide. And so here, the second most common cause of death in 15 century olds are suicide. So um, that's just becoming, suicide is becoming er just more earlier in people's um, lifetime and more common. So we need to do something about it. Um, so is depression the norm? That's, you know, I, I really hope it's not the norm, you know, and I, but I, at the same time, you know, it is somewhat the norm. I, I experienced it myself. I think health professionals, um, even non-health professionals, there's a prevalence of someone experiencing depression about 20 to 25% of their lifetime. So it happens. It's actually pretty normal to have depressive symptoms or some mild or moderate depression. Um, and those are typically during stressful times. Um, the most stressful times are either in a shift in um, location, in career, in some type of 
disaster like this, natural disaster, or it can be um, because of previous trauma during childhood, some ad we call it adverse child event where something happened that was really disruptive. If someone was moving or some type of abuse and it just kind of um, those little mini triggers become a huge, I would say, catalyst for something um, that creates disease such as depression later on in life. So um, this is something that's dear to my heart because 70%, 75% of those who seek help, so they come to the doctor's office, they just are talking about their you know, I have some ear pain, I have a rash, but really what we don't even know is that 75% of those who seek help um, have depression and that come to their primary care doctor. So a lot of these patients are not diagnosed. Um, they're not diagnosed in time. And so they're about missed. They're missed about 50% of the time because um, typically in the doctor's office, unfortunately, you have 15 to 20 minutes. You're just around the clock. Um, you, you're, the main focus is medications labs. Depression, mental health is usually at the bottom or maybe months later, sometimes years later. And that's the scary thing. That's why I think it's so, so important for us to understand that mental health is should be at the top of our priority, that depression should be screened, should not be missed, and that is here the stats are more than half of the primary care patients on anti depressants do not meet criteria for major depression. Hmm. So what does that mean? So it's saying we're missing um, the diagnosis of depression. It's saying a lot of people have depression and those who have depression, more than half of them don't meet the criteria. So what's going on? Is it truly depression? Is it truly what we think as someone who is needs that antidepressant? What is truly indicated to meet the diagnosis of depression? And are we missing something? Is there, what's the root cause here? Is something overlapping? And are we treating effectively? Are we treating on time? Or do we need to step back and see if something else is um, actually put, potentiating this? So I think those are some common questions I ask all the time um, directly with um, my patients just so we can help each other and we can get to the root cause. So how do we diagnose depression? This is according to the DSM-5, which is the most updated from um, APA, which is American Psychiatry Association. So you need to have depressed moods for at least two weeks. So that also means loss of interests or pleasures. You just don't feel like doing anything you love. If you like, if you have a certain hobby, such as you love decorating and you just don't want to do it anymore. If you are someone who wants to go out and actually, you know, you used to be a swimmer and now you hate, hate even the thought of swimming because you're just not interested anymore. So having that for two weeks and, you know, typically um, people grieve and that's actually normal to grieve. So when I say it's not because of bereavement, it's, you know, grieving takes weeks up to prolonged grief is actually when you have six weeks or two months of prolonged grief and you really can't, you're kind of stuck in this, the sadness for about two months, you're not able to go out of the house. Um, so Depression and bereavement and grief are different. So d depression is basically four of these. So you need two of those um, depress depressed mood and loss of interest or pleasure, and then four of these other symptoms. So, you know, I think it's really important to understand this because, you know, our doctors, our healthcare staff, um, we all are going to try our best to screen you, but it's also good. You're going to look things up and you're going to wonder, wait, do I have depression? So I'm just going to empower you and share what that means and what that looks like so that means change in sleeping patterns so you're either sleeping too little so too too little can mean um sleeping only two hours a night you know for everyone it's different um i know people who don't they take forever to fall asleep um and some people don't sleep at all i've ha i've met people who haven't sleep for weeks or months um because they just can't some people sleep too much 15 hours i would say eight seven to eight hours is a good amount of sleep. If you're sleeping six because of either situational, your choice or your lifestyle, you know, that's different. But if you just, you can't fall asleep, that's when you, um, we look at those patterns very closely. Um, change in appetite or weight. So this is unintentional. It's not because you have a certain disease. Um, for example, we always look at patients who have cancer. They're always having unintentional weight loss. Um, but this is a change in weight that you are not, um, you don't intend. You're not actually trying to restrict yourself of food intentionally. It's just you maybe don't, food does not look attractive to you um, or you're overeating. 
as well. So you're, we're always looking at that. Um, psychomotor agitation or retardation, that's a, I know that's a kind of a fancy medical term, but that just means you're constantly on edge. Um, and you're so on edge that it doesn't just look like anxiety, but literally um, you're you're depressed and you're and anything will you'll be hypersensitive, hyper alert. Um, and sometimes people actually go into psychosis and delusional in that state. Um, and then when we say psychomotor retardation, it basically means the slowing down where everything is so, so slow. So there's two types of depression where you're, you know, somebody on the outside looks like, for example, they, they look healthy, um, but they're, we call it typical and atypical. Typical means that, you know, they, they just look very sad. They, they're not moving, they're not sleeping, they're not eating. But other ones, they look, you know, functional, they look happy, but at the same time, um, they're, they're feeling other symptoms like loss of energy, loss of fatigue, the guilt and the worthlessness. So um, depression is actually very complicated, <laughs> to be honest. Um, and it, there's, it's so, there's so much complexities. So the slowing in the motor symptoms means you're you're not you're not moving you're actually your head is down you're you're moving very slow you're you're walking slow you're you're ta taking forever when i say forever you're just taking maybe twice three times as longer to finish task or finish if for someone if it's a student finish their homework if it's um, someone who stays at home, they, they're not keeping up with their chores um, and organization and their bills. And so loss of energy and fatigue um, is a common one. Those are the ones that can maybe be confused with um, someone who is just either burned out or someone who maybe has thyroid issues or someone who uh, is just having pure insomnia without depression. Uh, and so there's other ones, uh, feelings of self blame, worthless, and guilt. And those are the hard ones, right? This, this is not just negative um, thoughts, but this is um, negative uh, thoughts that just never end. So it's every day, all day, through the night, it's keeping them up. They they can't even, you give them a positive mantra, they flip it around, and they forget about anything positive. Um, so it's, it's a very hard place. It's a very dark place. Um, and then other times people have difficulty concentrating and it's hard for them to make decisions because either they're they're so agitated or kind of in slow in their decision making, or it's because they're kind of really fixated on their hopelessness, or they just don't they don't feel it. They don't feel good. They don't feel happy. They're overwhelmed. It's 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 doomsday for them. Um, every day, every moment. Um, we call this an overall generalization where um, to the typical eye, someone may think, well, that's a normal um, activity. For example, you get a flat tire, like, okay, that's life. Some people get a flat tire and it's the, unfortunately, the end of the world and they talk about it and ruminate it for ages. And that's kind of what, how depressive people um, respond is that um, they kind of really get overwhelmed by the, the simple task and the simple um, activities in life. And situations. Um, and so the thoughts of deaths or suicide. So that's what I was talking about the end stage, right? These are, these are clear thoughts, um, clear plans. These are uh, methods of how they harm our life. And those are the things that um, as providers, as, uh, as people who care, we, these are the things we want to avoid. These are the things that we want to really not miss. Um, these are the red flags that we have to capture right away, because um, that's, just like getting a stroke or heart attack, someone can die, same thing. Suicide is the same scary thing. Um, and so the warning signs of suicide, just to dive in a, a little bit deeper. So this is a, one of my favorite tables because here you have an example of heart attack and the risk factors. And we know that for heart attacks, increase of tobacco use, obesity, high cholesterol, such as LDL, and a uh, and if you're not moving, lack of exercise, um, and that really is what is going to increase your risk for heart attack. What's going to increase your risk for suicide is basically if you had a formal suicide attempt, if you ha had some type of diagnosis of mood disorder, substance use. So a lot of substance use, it comes hand in hand with, with all these mental disorders and also um, access to lethal means. So those are the kind of triggers of how the risk factors, what puts you there into, okay, these are the warning signs. Now, what are the protective factors? So with heart attack, we know exercise is great. Having a healthy, I'm always going to say plant-based diet, and I'll explain why later. Um, 
high HDL, stress management, those are good protective factors against a heart attack. Now, what does it do to our mental health, our depression, our suicide? So we need protective factors, and that is feeling connected with others, having a sense of community, and being available um, to Basically, a health professional was really great. So having access, um, getting the care, seeking help, and being able to cope. And I think um, we all struggle with coping. I think um, sometimes we're never taught to cope because we learn coping typically by modeling what was either around us by situations, maybe our parents that was passed on, or we learn healthy coping by sometimes it's self-taught um, because you, you, you thought it worked. For some people, they get that cigarette and that's what works. That makes them feel better. That makes them push through their day and finish their task. Um, and so, Coping abilities are really important. There's positive and negative ones. It's a very um, big topic of my, uh, that I like to teach in my clinic because teaching these positive coping mechanisms can really separate our um, dependence from unhealthy substances and really reinforce and reestablish healthy coping mechanisms because that's what it is. I, I really love studying human behavior and because this is, you know, plant-based nutrition, I love that that's a, a tool tool. But even before that, it's really to me, it's the behaviors, how can we get that motivation and that behavior to line up. So coping is awesome to really work on and then examples of warning signs. So um, of heart attacks, right? So that's that chest pain, shortness of breath, cool, having feeling a little bit sweaty, nausea, lightheadedness. Now, um, these are these life or death situations that you cannot ignore. Call 91, same thing for suicide. So if you have any um, thoughts of wanting to harm yourself, if you have when I when I said, um, you really deep hopelessness. And then if you keep using more alcohol and drugs, um, street drugs, I work with patients who actually use a lot of street drugs, cocaine, meth, and, you know, most of them have also a bad addiction to food as well. Um, so it comes hand in hand. And, and now the dr dramatic mood changes, so fluctuating mood changes up and down. So these are patients who a bit manic or bipolar and those are the most vulnerable patients and so um, I, I really try to help empower my patients recognize these signs so that they are aware and they can get help fast. Um, so um, I know that was the hard thing to swallow, but I'm going to share with you and kind of ease you into this very important topic. Um, so these are the VA guidelines for major depression, and in 2016, you know, they you'll you'll get it not just in medical training, but traditional medicine. They always say that the combination. This is what the studies and literature have shown that the, of psychotherapy and antidepressants are what does the best, what helps depression, and so these antidepressants are serotonin um, reuptake inhibitors so you may have seen it on the commercials Olaf Prozac it's on at least if you watch one hour of TV you'll see a couple of these um, Cymbalta, um, Welbutrin, Mirtazapine these are very very common and actually really I would say useful at the same time I use a combination of psychotherapy, antidepressants, but I always use plant-based and lifestyle first, but I would say there are times with at least moderate and severe depression to use this as a tool. And the reason why is that this is so complicated is because the natural course of major depression, and especially we looked at the primary care setting, the studies there is that it typically takes more than a year to recover. Um, it's hard because, especially if you're in the moderate and severe stage to get out of that, it's not easy. And once you're in this maintenance phase where everything feels good and great and you're over your hump, you typically need one more year of actual um, frequent, I would say visits, psychotherapy and medication. So it's not, it's not like, um, a headache, you take it and it's gone. Um, it's not like, for example, you have an infection, you take the medication and, and it's cured. With depression, there's, there's so many hormones, neurotransmitters that are that act that are so I would say it, the buildup and and the reuptake is it's a long process it's a chronic process so usually when the, by the time you have a diagnosis it's not that easy to fix um, but it is once you find what it is um, it, you can definitely overcome and definitely do it um, without medication if if you 
um, are guided with a medical professional. So I am, um, I will go into those possibilities, but I wanted to just share this with you because, um, not only does it take a year to recover, um, after being on medication, um, typically the more severe, um, and the more we say somatic symptoms. So those who really have a sense of slowing of their their concentration low energy um lacking sleep so the the feelings um take a while um and then eventually the behaviors will change um so this is fun right there's walnuts on one side like and and the walnuts remind me of the brain but what happens in between the brain the wires the chemicals what builds this powerful engine um in our brain what supports it um definitely no water a big portion of our brain is water a big portion of our brain needs all the healthy foods and and also these neurotransmitters what what actually feeds these neurotransmitters which i'm going to allude to in a bit. Um, but I would say these neurotransmitters, neuroepinephrine, serotonin, dopamine, glutamine, histamine, epinephrine, they all activate your nervous system in a good, healthy way. When you have too much of it, it's that fight or flight where you see a cute little cat, kitty cat, and it turns into a tiger and you're running the other side. Um, so there's a balance of that. Serotonin and dopamine, um, these are the reward pathway. So they're the feel good, happy hormones. Um, same thing with your glutamate and your histamine. So you'll kind of, you might hear these terms, histamine foods or what, what boosts the glutamate, all these things. They're all really important to really regulate these, your mood, your, your sleep, your energy. Uh, and if you don't have these, um, they're essential uh, because if you don't have them, they're, you're more prone not only to depression, anxiety, PTSD, but also dementia, Parkinson's, all those scary diseases that limit your movement, that, that limit your concentration, that limit your memory. And eventually it's a slow, it's a, it's a slow, sad um, deterioration of the brain. So that's the worst case, like another worst case. But I always like to think about, okay, let's Let's think about prevention, prevention. And we want to think about these healthy neurotransmitters. How can we support them? Um, so here are some other key players, and this might be some of the fun stuff because um, brain-derived neurotropic factor is another player that really helps activate the neurotransmitter pathways. And so foods that activate and increase it are cocoa, um, blueberries, soy, nuts, and seeds. So that's a fun one. Think of a dish for Thanksgiving in the holidays where you can combine it and make something delicious for your family because that's why they're gonna, they're not only gonna thank you, but they're gonna love you <laughs> and, and praise you for that because it feels good. The happy hormones are activated. Now the GAB and the MO are very important too. I'll go into detail later what they do, but all, all these, I would say nutrients and minerals and vitamins, they have the potential to support these pathways. And we need to be intentional. Just like, for example, we support our bone health, our gut health. We need to support our brain and mental health. So traditional antidepressants, uh, you'll see that is not candy on the side. Those are, that's not Halloween candy leftovers either. Those are pills and pills are not always the safest, right? We know that they have side effects. They have a lot of antidepressants. Um, the most common are nausea, vomiting, um, GI upset, right? So that's kind of confusing if you have IBS or IBD or you have Crohn's disease or you have some gut issue or even diabetes that causes, we, we call it high, some type of gastroparesis because all the nerves in your GI tract are overloaded with sugars and the in, insulin imbalance. And so everything, you end up slowing your digestion down and vomiting all the time. So if you have some, some person who doesn't just have depression, but has other chronic conditions, it's very hard to say what is causing it. Is it the side effect of the medication or is it their chronic disease? And so I look very, very carefully at side effects because, um, and how likely they're going to actually appear in somebody because those are the things that can guide us as doctors uh, management. Cause we know there's tons of options in these categories, but we also know that it can impair the quality of life. So even sexual dysfunction is actually one of the most common complaints of depression um, or antidepressants um, because it, it does um, dampen the sexual drive. And so you kind of have to use your, um, your way, the pros and cons and have a really 
I would say shared decision making. So a conversation with your doctor and be like, you know, this is what I'm hoping for. I'm scared of these side effects. How can we work together? And I would say find a doctor who talks to you about your side effects, please um, find a doctor who is actually involved in your in your care to explain what these medications do to your body um, because it's it's not all um, benign meaning it's it's not um, a pure medication there's always going to be some harm to it so but like again weigh the benefits versus the risk um, and here's another one um, I think I, okay. So besides the options of medications, which I said I use, um, and there's, there's a, a place and a time for them that can really help. Um, there's people have studied herbal medicine. So the American society, um, psychiatry association, they actually look at complementary and integrative medicine or looked at herbs and so St. John's Wars has been really studied um, closely um, to treat mild and moderate depression compared to placebo. There's about 14 short term of those studies, um, double blinded trials. So they use different dosing and you always want to check what the dosings are. And they're, they're saying it's actually helpful. Um, they're even saying it's helpful from another antidepressant such as amitriptyline. So that's an older medication that some people still use. Um, and there's a place and time for that as well. And I would say they've seen good, right, in those studies. Um, at the same time, um, there's they performed the biggest one of two large trials in the U.S. and they said it didn't really, you know, make a difference compared to placebo. Um, here again are the side effects for St. John's Wort. It has gastroenteritis um, upset. So and there's also a lot of drug drug interactions. We need to be careful. So in your know, immunosuppressants, um, chemo chemo drugs uh, and even warfare and, and blood thinners and uh, basically birth control, all those things um, that we have to be careful of. Just like um, medications are not exactly a pure um, way of treatment, so is supplements. We also have to be careful because supplement is still, is not always FDA regulated and if in different doses, it interacts with our body and our medications. So we always need to, the advice from our, our doctors. Um, they've also studied some other uh, medications that are really interesting. So saffron, um, lavender, people love lavender, right? There's like a whole phase of that, um, essential oils and all these extra things, you know, and I, I love it. I, it, it. Even in your food, it tastes good. But what is it? What have the studies shown? It's kind of inconclusive. It's, I, we definitely need more research to see the, the long term benefits. Um, Stan E, so you find this over the counter at most, um, I would say drugstores now. It, and it's really a natural occurring mo molecule in the liver and brain. And it really boosts your depression or your um, dopamine and serotonin. And so they, there are some studies that this is helpful for depression and effective. Um, but I would say at the same time, um, there still needs to be more conclusive studies because it's it usually is not um, it, when you think about all these supplements, it's not usually they, it's best used with a healthy lifestyle, but they also need another antidepressant as well. So it's not a standalone uh, supplement. Omega threes, who loves omega threes? I love omega threes. <laughs> um, I'm all about it um, because uh, we know there's tons of it in your plant-based foods, nuts and seeds. And so we look at the ratios of EPA and DHA and that combination, lots of studies there about how much to use for how long. And, you know, they vary, but um, basically the conclusions are that they help in depression, they help in mental health, they support uh, even when you take it with an antidepressant, it's actually really good to do that together. Um, and they looked at supplements too for omega-3 fatty acids and fish oil and, and tried to see the best composition, 60 to 40%. So these are, this is what the literature shows, but I'm, I'm just wanna emphasize omega-3s are awesome for your mental health. Um, vitamin B12. So we, we know when someone's on a more plant predominant diet so that we we need extra B, B12. Um, the B12 is, yes, produced by bacteria in your mouth um, in lo lower bowel area, but it's not enough. We need to supplement extra. And so here are some examples. You can get it from your non-dairy milks, your breakfast cereals, um, some of your, you, you have your nutritional yeast. You really have to check, but usually it's 
it's not enough. And I, I would say always check with either your a plant-based dietitian can really guide to see how much and always get checked um, at least once a year um, for vitamin B12. You don't want to short chain yourself and not know your levels because um, people uh, actually go sometimes too high or too low on that. Um, and so here's folate. So folate's awesome because it is a, a predictor. So this is an interesting study that they did is that it predicts antidepressant medication response. So the more folate you use, not only does it help your mental health, your supports your brain, but if you are given an antidepressant, it actually helps even better. It actually um, double, we call it, it's almost like synergistic. It, it just strengthens the, the, the antidepressant medication in a good way. And so if you have a lot of folate um, in, your, in your diet, the, you're, you're feeding your brain and your neurotransmitters at, in a way where you don't maybe need that antidepressant. So when I say folate, um, B12, all these minerals and vitamins that I'm going to present, these are the first line treatments. And so low folate blood levels have been associated with lack of response um, to fluoxetine, which is a very common antidepressant. So even if you're taking an antidepressant and you're, you know, and you're like, why isn't it working? I, I've been stuck. I, they increased my dose to the highest dose. They're giving me new antidepressants. Some people can be on two or three at the same time. I always say, check your folate levels, ask your doctor, um, because you may need an extra boost and you're maybe lacking in that because you, you want that to support your, your neurotransmitters. And so there's different, uh, um, I would say, studies to say how much one gram is always what I say, one milligram for women, especially in the reproductive age, that should be the bare minimum. Um, and so not only you're helping with your reproductive um, age in terms of, you know, when, when you're, if you think you're going to become pregnant, you're not going to have neuro I would say tube um, defects. So you're trying to um, minimize defects in your baby, but you're also trying to support your baby's brain and your own brain. So folate's awesome. One of my favorite um, vitamins. Um, so what are folate rich plants? So, okay, you guessed it. Yeah, greens and <laughs> beans. Um, oranges are awesome too. And um, almonds specifically, asparagus. Think of something you want to make as I list this out. Avocados, beets, cashews, um, fortified breakfast cereals, kelp, um, delicious kelp, kiwi fruit, legumes, um, beans, peas, lentil, soy food. So if I was going to make some recipes, I would literally be intentional. Um, and some people like these little tricks because they know what they're getting. And so I, that's why I present these examples. And mung beans are especially mung beet sprouts have a high amount, nutritional yeast, sunflower seeds, spinach, sprouted lentils, and the list goes on and on. So uh, the great thing about plants is not only does it have folate, but it probably has a bunch of other B vitamins and fiber, and it's the whole package. You can't go wrong. And that's what I mean. When we have medications and supplements, there's potential side effects. When we have plant-based foods, there's really very little side effects. Um, it's the purest, healthiest, whole plant-based form that you can uh, experience. It's the package that it can help heal your body and your mind. And so I, I mentioned this before, but let's remember health, healthy lifestyle is the first line treatment and prevention for mood disorders. And just to go in specifics of omega-3s, we're all about the plant-based ones. So flax, chia, hemp, um, at least, I always like to just do one tablespoon. It's just easy to remember um, of each in, with my day um, for breakfast. And then again, on my salad, um, I, I put it in everything. I, I have a few like recipes and jumpstart guides where I just show them, you know, you can get all your fiber, all your omega-3 actually in one meal. So if you do this two or three times a day, you're, you're, you're just all about, it's, you're not only preventing your disease, but you're getting extra bonuses that really protect you, your health. So um, I actually put this in my brown rice too. Um, I find really creative ways to put it in here. Probably like Chef AJ, she just finds new ways to, to um, prepare food. And so nuts are awesome. Like I said, walnuts are a key, a quarter of a cup. Um, soybeans, edamame, um, half a cup. So always putting that in my salads kidney beans, one cup cooked, Brussels sprouts, half a cup, wild rice, one cup, and firm tofu, another cup. So as you can see, if you make a Buddha bowl, you probably have so you have a good amount of your omega-3s uh, and even your other types of fiber and folate, all those, all in one package. So this is an example of what you can make on a day-to-day. 
flavonoids. Uh, so that's a fun word, right? Um, it's a polyphenol and it's a micronutrient naturally found in our favorites, fruits, vegetables. Um, and so here it mentions like tea, coffee, and cacao, right? And I know that's, I, I probably need to do another lecture because th there's something about all these other stimulants and what that does to the brain. But I would say in essence, um, they, there are still great studies showing that it has an effect on better cognition. Um, there's just more cerebral blood flow and it helps against the neuronal stress. And what does neuronal stress mean? Stress can be from the environment or from thoughts or from foods. And so these foods are really anti-inflammatory. Um, they help decrease the inflammation, the, the oxidative stress and support that neurotransmitter that I talked about, BDNF. And um, they're really cleaning up all the mess, right? When we have when, especially when, when with IBS, I know I shared my story, but you know, sometimes when you have um, a lot of stress, unhealthy thoughts, they're actually, all those things are creating free radicals um, um, that really promote more inflammation. And so not only it's not how you eat, it's what you think. Uh, so how you eat, how you think, and how you move. I, those are the key things of what I look at for a lifestyle. So look at this. Um, let's take you to the grocery store over here. Look at these options. Can you look at all the colorful um, fruits and vegetables and, and appreciate it? Because th these are the healing methods. Um, you can put something together and that are whole plant-based foods. So magnesium. So magnesium is a key uh, micronutrient. Um, it's a mineral. And we like to look at this not only because if you look at thousands, uh, this one says 100 years ago, to be specific, that's the study. Really, they didn't have much depress depression. Um, linking, we have higher rates of depression than ever um, in this, this century, this decade. Um, and they are looking at maybe is it because of the lack of nutrients in, in the foods that we eat or the lack of nutrients in our soil. It, it's not just because of our situation or the industrialization, but there's something else, something very specific. So they looked at studies of magnesium, um, about 125 to 300 milligrams with each meal and at bedtime. Um, and they were observing them, these patients who had high rates of depression. And they were noticing that, the, you know, there was a, a correlation of how if they had magnesium, they're actually less had less depressive symptoms. Um, and so if you look in the gut health world, a lot of patients use magnesium for constipation, actually, or, and that, that helps. And there's a mechanism behind that. But also magnesium helps with sleep, what helps with headaches and lessen anxiety and depression. So magnesium is an actually powerful tool that we can use. It's very, I would say, safe, um, you know, in over the counter doses, but also more importantly, they're the safest in your foods, in your plant based foods. So um, know that you have an opportunity to use magnesium. And this is a really good study in 2013, which says vegan intakes of magnesium are significantly higher than those of non vegetarians and are more than adequate. So if you're worried if you're plant based or a vegan or transitioning to that, and you're like, Oh, I need to take extra supplements, you actually don't you already have it all in your food. And that's also another protective mechanism um, from depression, anxiety and mental uh, disorders. So it's your the magnesium you're getting from your foods. So here is zinc. Um, zinc is also very important. In the hospital, we look at zinc because um, it helps with improving healing. So patients who have a diabetic wound ulcer, or they just had an amputation, or they maybe even had surgery, we actually check zinc levels because um, wound nurses know this, is that if you have too little zinc, it's going to take longer for you to repair your and heal. Um, another reason why people look at zinc too is because um, hemorrhagic strokes. There's just been some studies, specifically strokes, that if you have low zinc, you're more likely to get um, stroke. And so those are maybe are not like the definitive cause. Like it's not just because you have low zinc doesn't mean you're going to get a stroke, but they were just saying that there is some type of correlation there. And we're always looking for that, right? We want to have them the best chances of, of beating our disease, the best chances of winning and having a long life. And when I say winning, we want to thrive. We want, I, I really 
want to empower us to, despite the chaos out there, we, we still are winning with each day of our life. We're, we're, we're given a, a time to breathe, a moment to enjoy our food. So um, when it comes to zinc, um, know that it is has the potential um, that it can augment um, depression and anxiety medication. So here, it, this is a good study. It's a double blind, randomized, single um, center. Um, study that looked at it and basically um, they're, they had lower rates of depression because they had adequate zinc. And so, um, you know, there's a zinc craze out there um, just because of viruses and COVID and all of that. But I would say zinc in itself is something that, that just that helps so many different things. Um, like I said, wound healing, and it helps with mental health, it helps with viruses. And please, it's not the time where we overload on zinc, but we overload on plants. <laughs> and so um, we also know that zinc is uh, really important because it helps with our hormones, um, specifically with dopamine. Um, it helps with the conversion of thyroid. Um, There's so many studies that study zinc. And now cucumin. Uh, who loves turmeric? <laughs> I do. I, I just put in everything. It gives it a nice yellow color. It, and I didn't grow up on turmeric either. You know, I'm actually Filipino, Filipina. Um, and I, I just didn't know what that spice was, but I got introduced to it. And now I put it and sprinkle it everywhere. And so this study was really nice because um, they looked at 500 milligrams twice a day and it and looked at it uh, for eight weeks of every day, twice a day use. And it was comparable to treating major depression. And I was, and that that's a pretty strong, good study um, to look at that uh, the comparison between curcumin and and an antidepressant. Um, and and I really think about because it's treating the chronic inflammation. If we th think of major depression, um, and even depression is not still not well understood. Even though I presented all the neurotransmitters and everything beh behind that, it's really the the disease state starts at the inflammation state. Um, so curcumin can be as effective as Prozac. Isn't that cool? In another 2014 study. And it also, we want to, it depends on absorption. So you want to make sure you're, you're eating it um, when you can actually eat it with a nut butter or tahini or, or some other um, plant-based fat. And that increases the bioavailability bio and absorption of that. And then of course, with black pepper, it doubles, triples the potency of cucumin. So a bonus there for you. And here is another one. I keep talking about recovery, <laughs> um, but let's see, here it is. So looking at population observable studies, and that basically looks at people over a long amount of time, large amount of people, and we get to understand their behaviors, their patterns, and looking at, you know, we see this in Adventist health studies and nurse health studies, EPIC. Internationally, there's big key studies that look at not just the ones that are most popular, such as diabetes, high blood pressure, stroke, heart attack, but also depression. Um, so higher occurrence of depression symptoms in those with vegetarian um, diet, people who adopt the vegetarian lifestyle compared to those who don't. And then we see that 80% of women found a beneficial association between a vegan diet and mood disturbance. So that basically means that those who ate more plant-based um, notice that there's a bigger difference in their mood stability. So, um, and you know, as women, we always are thinking about our, our, ourself and our hormones and when it comes to mood and, you know, there's PMS, there's perimenopausal, there's menopausal, postmenopausal, and we always want healthy hormones and healthy hormones also means healthy brain hormones. So they're always tied. I'm a family doctor, so I'm always connecting all the dots here. <laughs> um, so here's another connection we're going to make, the brain biome connection. So this is your brain all the way to the gut. And this is a nice um, diagram because literally what we eat, what we swallow, digest, um, goes into our entire GI tract and hits our little one cell layer thick of our immune system. But also this is our mood regulator, our mood regulator because our our serotonin uh, and our neurotransmitters and our dopamine also live in the gut. Um, so it's not just your immune system, it's your, your brain health actually lives in the gut. And so 
this is just a fun diagram because not only is it really tiny and small, but it is very powerful. It, it increases the cytokine pathways of your inflammatory systems like CRP and interleukin-6. Um, and, you know, if you look at medicine, you may have gotten tested for CRP either because you had some autoimmune disease or your, your doctor was thinking you had some type of inflammation and now they're looking at high sensitivity CRP for cardiac disease. Um, and so, these cytokines, they're the signals. They talk to us. They help us measure how much inflammation there is. And then we, we look closely at mental health because we know there's a high tie in to other metabolites. So we look at A1C, I look at insulin, cholesterol, and then the short fatty acids. That's from our fiber. And we I'm going to talk about that later. But Overall, the key to that brain biome connection is um, the more we can have eat healthy things, have more plant based foods, uh, we can really, really decrease our risk for obesity, heart attack, stroke, diabetes, even cancer. So it's a win, 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 win. <laughs> what is that? Five wins. Um, so that your whole body and brain and your biome really are benefited from your eating. And so let's talk about that microbiome gut brain dysfunction. So we, we hear a lot about the um, dysbiosis at the gut level, um, but there's an even deeper level that connects to our brain. So it's the gut brain axis dysfunction. They, they talk and walk towards each other all the time. Um, there's not just the spinal cords, but there's neurons and transmitters. That's why we have all these sensations in our fingers and our tummy and in our brain, they all talk. Um, and so, 90% of serotonin and 50% of dopamine are both essential for mood, energy levels, motivation, sense of reward. They're all produced where? In the gut. <laughs> yeah, it's all about the gut, all about how your gut responds to what you eat in addition and how it responds to your lifestyle. And so um, I love this diagram because it just shows that um, the red side is basically the harmful side, such as chronic stress, the dysfunction of your brain, and um, even the, we call it the hypothalamus, um, uh, and he, there's HPA, which is just another brain activation um, pathway that focuses on the structure of your brain, and then the gut brain dysfunction. So all that's the red. And what can trigger that? The actually poor diet. Um, and, and also antibiotics can also alter that. The, your microbiome. And then what's the good side? So that's the, the good of prebiotics, healthy diet. Um, and there's other things there, psychotherapy. There's so many things that I would love to go into deep tell, but the main thing is you want to support your, your hormones, your neurotransmitters, your HPA um, access, um, and then your vagus nerve. There's a lot of talk now about vagus nerve because of um, we're finding ways to meditate. We're trying to find ways to relax and activate the vagus nerve by our breathing, by, by being in tune with nature. So vagus nerve is something very real and, and we, we need to support that. And that's another lecture that I will have to bring up another time. So plant-based nutrition. So this is, this is where the money is. When I say money, that means that's where the plants are because <laughs> it's green. Um, so green, green, green. Look at over the years from 2000 to 2010 to now 2020, the amount of research, um, the amount of knowledge, the amount of people, I would say, who've actually adopted the plant-based diet. And you see how the, the greens are, are winning, right? The plant-based are, they're, they're doubling, they're going high, high amounts, almost up to 400 per year of studies. So this is not going away. The, the science is there. Um, and now we just got to keep living it and being consistent um, and know that you, you are supported by science. And we're here to support you um, because fiber is another um, F. I talked to flavonoids. Now I'm talking about another F word, fiber, the good, the good one. Um, and that's really because there's an overlap. When I talked about IBS and depressed mood anxiety, um, that's where it is. It's because they're all connected. And when you alter your gut bacteria, um, that means your serotonin, your neurotransmitters are also altered and your, your gut cannot function. So fiber is what helps support your gut. Um, you've probably heard leaky gut on this um, podcast already, the show. And so fiber keeps it all intact. Um, but, and so that you're, you're not leaking these, um, 
inflammatory signals to the, to the entire body, but fiber also produces short chain fatty acids, which bring down inflammation, not just in all your diseases um, that I mentioned before, but also in your, in your brain, which is responsible for your mood. Um, and so here is what, there's two types of fiber, soluble and insoluble. These are the, really the things that feed the microbiome. You wanna keep your trillions of bacteria happy. You wanna keep it healthy. You wanna keep it diversified. You wanna feed, um, feed your gut because um, you're feeding your brain. And then they really are the ones responsible uh, because there's another labor, right? Not only do we find fiber in all of this, we find monounsaturated and polyunsaturated plant fat. So that's in your nuts and seeds, supporting your, your brain. Walnuts are key. Um, and so what do we recommend? So I, I like 43 grams of walnuts, um, you know, because of this study, um, they actually studied um, how it promotes the, the food for the bacteria, which is like the probiotic terminology, but the food for bacteria is actually walnuts. And they studied it in long trials, three and eight weeks, two randomized control style um, studies. And they found that walnuts are just like we projected. It's the shape of the brain and feeds the brain, feeds the gut. Easy to remember. <laughs> um, and then sulfurane. So this is awesome because it's found in your little trees, your fruits and vegetable, cauliflower, broccoli, arugula, kale, cabbage. And so this is one of the, the, it started with a rat study. And when you think about studies, they try to study it at the little little dish level, then they go to the rats and the mice and the, you know, and then they'll start, they tried their best in humans. And we, it's, when I think about science and study, it's, there's always gonna say more research is needed. And as you can see, there's tons of research that's already been done. Um, and there's never a, the, uh, the perfect, perfect study, but we do our best. Um, and I would say this is my, just my plug to um, allow you to appreciate the, the plants um, because the plants are the safest, the healthiest for you. And, and I, I love the science behind it all, um, but more than so, I love how it can, it really changes people's lives. I see this day in and day out um, where my patients are literally saying, you know, I, I, I feel happier, have a better mood. I, I not only lost the weight, but I have a lot of patients with anxiety and depression and they, they have a more motivation, more, uh, they're just, people will look at them is a different person. They're not sweating anymore. <laughs> they're not to the point where they're shaking. Um, so really because of food uh, and the healthy lifestyle. So inflammation um, is really, f let's see who our culprits are. And those are really our animal products, our red meats, our cheese, our dairy, our processed red meat, our deli uh, products, um, really um, because of the substance. Um, one of them is the TMAO. That's kind of the newer studies starting in um, 2013. So they looked at this and what does it do? It talks, it talks again to the microbiome and it just releases poison, unfortunately, to your liver, your kidneys, your brain. Um, and these are the people who are getting, unfortunately, um, having the strokes and the heart attacks. So we just need to know um, the why. And I think that helps, right? We always want to know the why. We want to know the why we are sick. Um, why do we want to get better? And um, why is it all worth it at the end of the day? And so um, processed foods is something that we are the most influential factors of having the, the biggest culprit for a poor diet. So we know that there's tons of additives um, that really alter the, the chemicals in the brain. Um, I think I was reading there's for sugar, there's at least a hundred types of different names for sugar. MSG has 30 names. There's just more and more. There are artificial flavoring, artificial chemicals that really alter our, our mood, our neurotransmitter reactions. And so we need to be very careful of these processed foods. They really destroy our gut and really um, make us prone for depression. Um, so this is kind of, uh, 2010, and, and this is well recognized with our arachnoic acid. We say AA. Um, basically, that's found in animal products. Um, but really, the more you look at the studies, they show that there's a negative impact on mental health because of neural inflammation. So brain is inflamed. Um, mood is inflamed, it's because of what we eat um, from these animal products. And people with higher levels, this is a very interesting study in 2014, uh, people with higher levels of the anaerobic 
acid in the blood may end up with significantly higher risk of suicide and depression. So, you know, the more we're looking at it, it's another tie-in of what plants are, I'm sorry, what animals do versus plants. Um, so here's animal products again, top sources of arachnic acid, eggs, chicken, beef, pork, fish. So um, those are high um, amounts. Although chicken and eggs um, alone are the top sources, those other sources are things like, think of a pizza, people put every kind of animal on it. And like, okay, that's your, sadly your recipe for a, a bad mood. You know, we talk about our good foods and we also, you know, talk about our, our bad food moods. Um, those, it's a bad, just a bad setup, unfortunately. And that's why after eating these types of food, immediately people talk about low energy, sluggish brain food. And, is that, and that's hard. Is that depression or is that just what you ate that day, right? If you see your doctor, someone looks at you and you, then you're like, oh, what did you eat today? They don't ask you that. <laughs> They're probably just going to be asking you, uh, what are your symptoms? And they might automatically diagnose you with depression, but maybe it's because of the, the food you ate that day. Um, so overall, omnivores tend to consume nine times more arachnic acid than their plant-based counterparts. Ha, huh, that's a lot. So they're getting nine times the amount of inflammation in their body. Um, so no wonder they feel horrible. Um, and no wonder they're getting sicker, sadly. So um, there's a reason for this. And so I just wanted to present that to you. And then dairy. So just a single egg's worth of uh, the AA arachnic acid a day may significantly raise uh, your AA in your, in your blood. So, you know, there's a lot of these things, like I, I'm all about self-compassion and even um, supporting these, the process and the journey. And, he, and it's really not about perfection, but just know that even if you're doing one egg a day, it's every time a trigger, every time you're, in, you're traumatic, you're basically insulting your gut, insulting your brain um, in, and pushing it towards sickness instead of healing and recovery and quality, healthy life. So just know one meal, one, one meal can make a difference. <laughs> Um, here's another one. So I put the ER there because this is interesting. We, we want, uh, MAO is basically a neurotransmitter in your brain. Um, and there's actually a medication to make sure that you um, don't have too much of it um, because you can potentially have these raise your blood pressure. But on top of that, um, you if you eat too much cheese, too much tyramine, cured meats, and ferment um, fermented foods, I I wouldn't I would be careful with that. I would probably say meat, more cheese and the cured meats are the top two. All together, they can increase your risk for a hypertensive crisis and also a fatal brain hemorrhage. So that's a brain bleed. Um, and so that's what we have to be careful if you're taking that medication, um, uh, MAO inhibitor, that's why it's an old medication, no one ever uses it. Um, so there's that cheese effect. And I, but instead, we can take foods that in, lower our MAO, that can help our brain, and we don't have to take the medication. Instead, we can find that there's actual naturally occurring MAO inhibiting factors within your apples, berries, grapes, onions, green tea, cloves, oregano, cinnamon, and nutmeg. I don't know about you, but that sounds delicious and safe to me. <laughs> and all in, you can put it in your dessert or drink or whatever you may want. Um, and then here, I, I always like to think about where does serotonin come from? Where does dopamine come in, come from? There are neurotransmitters that come from an amino acid. Um, so an amino acid are these essential proteins that we eat. Um, and so it comes from tryptophan, tyrosine, from the foods we eat, and they're found mainly in plant-based foods. So here they call it complex carbs, but really tryptophan is amino acid that goes, it talks to your brain, and it, it, it produces the serotonin, the happy, bear, happy hormone. And so some people think of happy carbs as waffles. Um, and, you know, here's a study that they actually looked at more turkey, more eggs, more cheese actually produce more depression like symptoms. The higher tryptophan levels that were better and safer were things such as um, like orange juice. Um, I'm not sure what kind of waffles they use, but I would say that um, if looking at better sources of tryptophan and tyrosine are sesame seeds, sunflower seeds, and pumpkin. So those are my go-to ones. There's a little bit of that also found in tempeh and beans and tofu, but um, I try to remember them as the seeds. Um, so 
there was a study on um, butternut squash seeds, um, also Thanksgiving themed, is social anxiety disorder. They looked at that and looked to see how it, after one hour, they ate it and it actually helped their anxiety. So that was one, you know, one small study, but that was really neat to see that connection. Okay, so let's tie it all in together. Um, when I think about plant-based eating, vegan, um, vegetarian, all those things, it's never standalone. I, it's healthy eating is a puzzle piece um, to a healthy life, a healthy, healthy mood, a healthy body. And I look at physical activity, uh, stress management. I look at avoidance of toxic or substance use and restorative sleep and our relationships. So all together can not only help our mood, it can help our, our metabolic issues as well. So I keep, I keep throwing it in there, right? The best cure of mood disorders is prevention. Um, and so we'll start with the fun one because I think being outdoors and nature and everything all about lifestyle and exercising is actually getting enough bright light therapy. So they studied this in seasonal affective disorder and, and major depression disorder. So this is a short-term um, placebo-controlled trial. And this basically says they, they found it useful for three types of people uh, who may benefit. So those, it can help patients who don't respond to traditional um, antidepressants or those who never responded because they tried everything, um, all the antidepressants possible. And then it also speeds up um, antidepressant treatment. So really needs and helpful um, and also can help um, those who are sleep deprived. Um, and so it's really low risk, low cost. There's different types of frequencies and all about bright light therapy. But I like to say it's it's helpful. It's first thing in the morning. You can get it by walking outside if it's sunshine. But if you're living in the Midwest um, where there's not much, um, then you you can buy a bright, a bright light therapy light um, as an option. So exercise. So uh, exercise makes me, this thing makes me want to stand up and walk, but because we're constantly sitting. And so the studies have shown that because of our poor lifestyle, um, we have increased risk of depression. We're not getting enough. And, but there are also studies that show the other end, meaning the more exercise we do, um, the more likely we have um, less rates of depression. And so there's some small studies that compare antidepressant and a and a uh, 30 minutes of exercise or one hour in different um, activities or different modes if it was moderate or vigorous and they show hey it works similar to an antidepressant but even more effective or or equal to it so cognitive effects of um, fluoxetine which is an antidepressant and exercise and they show that not just in mice but in humans too and so Exercise therapy is really powerful. It regulates our gut microbiome, the gut brain access. And so just remember to move, um, move out there as much as you can, as frequently as you can. So stress management. Um, so stress is actually one of the leading causes of depression. Um, and it's really something that is, it's one of those things we, we, we have to talk about, right? If we're talking about mood disorders and de depression, um, they come in hand in hand. And so finding ways to, to really manage your stress by healthy coping mechanism, by positive self-talk, by getting a behavioral counselor, by seeking a psychiatrist or the day-to-day -day things. For me, it's being outdoors in nature. For other people, it's walking. Um, other times it's group therapy, there's um, methods to do this. And so pay attention to that. Um, and then avoidance to risky substance use. So as I said earlier, we're, we tend to, uh, when we're in a depressive anxious state, we tend to seek out other substances, if it's food, or if it's a substance. And so for some people, it's smoking, alcohol, um, and sugar, um, or it can be other types. And it's really the habit, emotional, physical component. That's why we seem really stuck there. It's because over time, um, you do it every single day, and you, it's an unconscious habit. Now the physical dependence is because of the neurotransmitter dependence. And then the emotional dependence is because we're just so used to that relief um, or that feel good um, sensations. So I would say it's complicated, but it's possible. Um, just like smoking cravings only last for, they say two minutes, 
that's how the sugar cravings last, um, two minutes up to five minutes. So if you get past that, you're going to be okay. Um, so I work with patients um, to help overcome their addictions too. It's another deep, large topic. Um, and so neurotransmitters role, once again, these are attention, appetite, um, desire all together to help support your brain by avoiding these addictions. Um, Cause really the, the nicotine is, it lives in our brain. Um, and so we need to stay away from that. Um, purpose, motivation, wholeness. I just put some fun pictures to this because at the end of the day, uh, I always think about uh, how, what keep us, what, uh, when I see patients on the near deathbed, I ask them what, gives them meaning and to keep going what do they look forward to and I think that keeps us grounded and it keep a, keeps us in a way where we can try new things or we're open and so if that's spending more time with family making positive memories and doing things you enjoy I think you need to balance that all in together when you're trying to incorporate a healthy lifestyle and that's challenging right when you're depressed no one feels like going out um, they start to withdraw. Um, when they are depressed, they have no appetite. So how do you get to that, right? Um, so going really writing it out, writing out what is your, your motivation? What, what keeps you alive? Those are my simple questions, but sooner or later, later they'll find it. And I think it's just finding that, um, being comfortable and telling uh, your, your family, your friends and connecting with them. So um, once again, I talked a little bit about some of the side effects of antidepressants and it, it can be confusing because it's the diarrhea, GI upset, headaches. Psychotherapies are safe and healthy. I say get therapy, please, because it's for the healthy and unhealthy. It's for the depressed and undepressed. It's for everyone because it teaches you healthy coping skills. When things are good, things are great and when things are horrible. And so um, I, I really think counseling is so important because once you learn these mechanisms, that is part of the prevention. You can identify what your triggers are. You can identify your negative thoughts and negative behaviors. So um, healthy plant-based lifestyle, complete whole lifestyle with all the pillars, but also psychotherapy. Um, I'm a huge fan because it's really side effects are pretty much none. Um, and then I also just was cautious about your supplements that I mentioned, St. John's Wars. Um, exercise, also very, very safe, um, benefits the entire body. And then watch out for discontinuation syndrome. That basically means once you're feeling well and you, you tell your doctor, you know, I, I adapted a healthy lifestyle. I'm, you know, you may say I'm more plant-based. I feel good. I, I, I don't think I need my antidepressant medications. You might be at that point, but watch out because it's a, you need to be watched closely with your doctor because if you take it, out too fast, you might actually get more agitated. And so I saw this in the hospital setting where um, patients had worse pain, worse headaches, their, their heart rate was up, everything was kind of just um, it, out of out of sync because they took their medication off too quickly. So we have to be very careful for that and just seek your doctor out and they're there to help you, especially plant-based doctors. <laughs> um, and so What's the here and now? Um, so the here and now is that we know that there's available treatments that are effective, that that are for specific conditions, um, but it takes time. Most antidepressants take up to four to six weeks to get the, the side effect that they, and I'm sorry, to get the response that actually shows positive outcomes. So it takes time to get, to reset your brain. Um, and then also those side effects. So just know that the, the here and now is medications are useful. Um, at the same time, it takes time. And then lastly, um, for a variety of reasons, um, maybe it's stigma, um, but it's underdiagnosed. So this is um, a fun, a fun but sad statistic. Um, basically, people who have depression, they're untreated. So approximately 75% in the UK and 92% in China. High amounts of patients not getting um, help, not getting, getting diagnosed with depression and not getting treated effectively. And so antidepressants work well for about, they say about half of those who actually seek help. So that's what are the settings, studies are showing. So what's the other 50%? The other huge 50% is our lifestyle, is our nutrition and our sleep. So um, I, this is a, 
to sum it up, um, what do we eat? So seven servings of fruits, eight servings of vegetables actually made a meaningful impact on mood disorders, on their mental health. So time and time again, um, try to find those foods in your diet um, consistently. Bottom line, um, it's delicious, it's yummy, it's doable. I'm so much happier. I lost the weight, my skin's better. And many patients' lives have changed and it's and it, it's so much better on the other side. Uh, and so that's a little bit about me. I forgot to put some of my contact information on there, um, but I, I can share it with you. Let me just stop the screen so I can see Dr. Chef AJ, or Chef AJ's face. <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing. I was taking some notes. I, I can't believe that, it, that, it, that curcumin was as effective as Prozac. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, it's a great study. Um, yeah, there's specific little hints of herbs and foods that act exactly like these antidepressants. <laughs> and the thoughts can actually create free radicals. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's it amazing. People don't, tell, you know, you, nobody tells you about that. Yeah, you, you, you have to dig a little bit. <laughs> you know, I think my favorite thing that we, when you talked about cravings, that they can actually go away in two to five minutes. So if people could learn some techniques for just waiting them out. They might, you know, not have to succumb to them. Yeah, exactly. So two to five minutes of taking a small, small walk, calling a friend, drinking water. By that time, you're done with your craving. <laughs> So that, those are so, my, my distraction um, activities to help people get over their cravings. That is so cool. Well, this was so amazing. I really appreciate it. And can people actually make a consult appointment with you online? Oh, yeah. yeah, they sure can. So you can find me at drlifestyle.org. Thank you for asking. And that's where you can find our website is actually being updated this weekend where you can make an appointment. But I also have another website, Melissa MD, Melissa Mandela MD, um, dot com. I'm also on social media, so Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. I have some recipes and fun things there. And so you can definitely find me. If you can't find me, just Google me, Melissa Mandela MD, and you'll be able to find all my websites and my work there. That is terrific. Well, thank you so much. And I'll put all this information in the show notes. This was a wonderful presentation. I'm sure I'm going to have to watch it again because I actually did take notes and I really appreciate it. And I, I love your passion for the, the subject. Ah, oh, thank you. It's a pleasure. Thanks, Chef AJ. I, I can't wait to keep tuning in and supporting your plant-based family. Right. And I hope people will go to your website because you guys, you and your husband have some wonderful recipes on it. Yeah, we do recipe blogs and uh, my, my husband's going to be sharing his autoimmune story and um, even autoimmune um, ingredients that you can find in plants that can really help support your immune function. So very excited. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Mandala. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow. We're doing the show later because of the summit. We're doing it at 4 p.m. when we have some special guests who are in their 80s and use the plant-based diet to recover from their illnesses. Thanks again, Dr. Mandala. Take care. Thank you. Have a great day.